Good morning, Clear Creek. We are so glad that you're here this morning, and it's good to see all your smiling faces. Thank you, Paul, for the good work you do leading worship, and Bill for your thoughts of our communion devotional. Uh, we're in a series called We Can't Stay Here, and it's based on the idea and the, the story of Jesus and Peter, James, and John going up the Mount of Transfiguration and seeing Jesus, Moses, and Elijah transfigured there, and how that Peter really would have liked to have stayed there, but he was pushed on to do greater things, things that were very important, and like that, our church is at a really good place, but we're being pushed on to do some greater things and things that are very important for the people who are around us. So I'm glad you're here. We've talked about how empty seats are serious issues, that we want to make sure that we see seats as an opportunity uh, for influence. We talked last week about using your spiritual gifts. This week we're going to talk about how growing people change. But before we do all that, uh, we'd like to introduce you to some special people who've decided they want to be a part of the family here at Clear Creek. Uh, the first couple is Zach and Caitlin Statham. Uh, they just went through Pass and Go there. I know they're here because I sat beside them. If you would, please stand up. And Joel and Melissa Taylor. They're here somewhere. I know they're here too. Oh, they're right in front of me. I'm... It's kind of cool to see people come home. You know, Zach grew up here. And uh, he uh, went off to Harding and tricked some girl into marrying him and uh, came back. We're glad that you're home, Zach and Caitlin. You're, you're wonderful. Can't wait to see what God's going to do with you. And Joel used to be a youth intern at our church here too. And, and he and his wife, Melissa, have come back and they're expecting a boy. And we're, we're very happy for them. If you don't know these people, you need to get to know them. They're great folks. And uh, I can't wait to see what God's going to do with all four of you, five of you, uh, as, as he brings you here to Clear Creek. Another special thing is going on this weekend that, that I'm really thrilled about. And uh, I just want to show you something really cool. Will you put the slide up, uh, Phil? We had a baptism in China. Uh, and feel free to try and pronounce her name, but we call her Jennifer. <laughs> all right? They give all, uh, when they have a baptism in China, they give them an American name, and this girl goes by Jennifer. Uh, she was baptized in the Christ. So if you think that your efforts are not doing any good, the kingdom is expanding all over the world. It's because of the efforts uh, right here uh, at, at Clear Creek. And as a matter of fact, there's a group that will be leaving for China at the end of the week, and I'd like to introduce them to you, and we'd like to pray over them. So if you would, when I announce your name, please stand, and then we're going to take just a moment to pray over you this morning before we begin our lesson. Uh, the leaders are going to be Jim and Chris Marlowe. They're sitting right down here. M amazing people, by the way. Uh, Rob and Kim Feisley. Ginger Hanna. Gail Stokes. Matt Haynes. Allie Ray. And Katie DeLay. Guys, we are so glad that you guys are going to go to China. We know that uh, you're going there to encourage other people. But I have a funny feeling, having been on trips before, that you're going to be greatly encouraged as well. Uh, stick together. Lift one another up. And before you go, as a church family, we'd like to pray over you. So let's pray together. God, you're an amazing God, and I thank you for the people who are uh, about to leave and go to China. I thank you for the people who will be at home praying for them and supporting them in this work. Uh, we pray that this will be a safe trip, that it will be a good trip, and that much good will come from this, that, that the people who are working over there will be encouraged uh, by this team, uh, that, that they can teach the Bible, and that people will come to know you. Father, we know that, that life is about relationships, and it's about the relationships that we have with you. And so our prayer, Father, is that you'll be with Jim and Chris as they lead this team and be with the entire team as they go abroad to do great things in the name of your son, Jesus. And it's in his name that we pray. And amen. Thank you, guys. Well, Brett documented a day in the life of his infantilism. Take a look. This is something I wanted to show you guys. The crib was made by one of my best friends. I got the uh, crib design from uh, online um, for an actual adult baby crib. The crib altogether was around $350 to $500. Money well spent, in my opinion. Make you happy, boy. This is the chair I made right after my crib. Um, it's a high chair. It's uh, three and a half feet off the ground. This probably costs around 250 
to $400 to do all together. I throw stuff off here, I have tantrums, I eat, I get messy. Ooh. Mm. More? Yeah. Oh. The food was on the tray, I'm, I'm, I'm in my baby chair and I'm, I'm good to go. Down on the bed, I have all my onesies, my rompers, my snap pants. I have these things specially made from people off eBay who are really nice. Diapers and clothes and the whole baby stuff is not cheap. As a baby, it's not cheap. You should see it as an adult. Most of the money that we spend is on Brett and his baby things. All the baby clothes in my closet is approximately worth $4,000. <laughs> There's nothing more soothing than the bars being all the way up and me kind of glimpsing and looking and there she is checking on me. And I couldn't ask for anything more. It's real. It's something called infantilism, man. It's, uh, it's something where there's a persistence in an adult to have markedly childish traits you childish traits and usually is a psychological disorder as you watch that uh it's sad uh, we all know as we watch that person who later on in the show would claim that he is stuck at 18 months old uh, emotionally he works all day comes home puts on his baby clothes and he's a baby the rest of the time uh, it begs a lot of questions uh, I, I would like to know the other guys that this girl dated that she thought he was a prize. Um, sorry, that, that was, that wasn't good. Um, but do you see how tragic that is? Do you see the tragedy in this person who feels like they're stuck at being a baby? And the problem with that is, that there are a lot of Christians who are that way. Uh, they, they come to Christ and they're an infant in Christ and, and there are times that we're supposed to be babies in Christ. That, that uh, when you're baptized into Christ, it's a new birth and this new birth, you, you're to start there and you begin to grow and you begin to learn and you start to grow into things. As a matter of fact, Peter even mentions this in the book of 1 Peter in chapter 2, verses 2 and 3. Uh, we read these words, it says, Like newborn babies... Crave pure spiritual milk so that by it you may grow up in your salvation. Now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. And basically Peter is saying, uh, as, as people who are new to this Christianity, who are new to being a part of God's family, that, that it's a good idea for you to start somewhere. Everybody starts somewhere. And he says, well, there's a couple of things that's going to start taking place once you're a Christian. Number one, you're going to grow up in your salvation. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean you're not saved? Does that mean that you, you've got to grow into the salvation? No, you've always had your salvation. When you're baptized in the Christ, you're saved. You're completely saved, totally saved. Don't question that. What I'm trying to tell you is that sometimes we have things that we have to grow into. For instance, when I was a little boy, believe it or not, I was skinny. I was painfully skinny, and um, my ears were really big. Not like they are now. I had really big ears, and I, I would be made fun of. And, and what happened was, I grew into those ears. Uh, a lot of times, we, we have physical attributes that we eventually grow into. And there's things in our life that we eventually grow into. Our salvation is the same way. You know, we don't really understand the power of that salvation. We really don't understand the motivation behind that salvation. We don't really understand how we can share that salvation with other people. Because when we first become Christians, that salvation is all about us. Because the next thing he says is that, that you're to grow up like these babies if you taste that the Lord is good. Because that's always the starting point with spiritual babies. Uh, spiritual babies usually will come to Christ for the simple reason that they understand that God is, is at his core good. And, and that they can count on this goodness of God despite the badness of the world around them. And that's something that draws them to this God. It's his goodness. But there's more to God. There are many facets to this God, and as we come to know more about God, uh, we also know that he is a righteous judge. Well, it's really difficult when you think of him as being good and good only to see him as a righteous judge, but that's part of growing into that salvation. 
You see, we're supposed to be spiritual babies for a season. But many people have become, like this person in the video, spiritual babies for no reason. They, they stay an infant. They, they don't desire to grow in their faith. And, and, and they don't want to be challenged. They want everything has got to be good, and we're always going to be uplifting. I'm not going to be challenged at all. And, and Paul has already said, you know, growth is painful, and it can be very painful. We'll talk about that a little more later. And believe it or not, we didn't even talk about that. It's amazing that he mentioned that. The church at Corinth was not a new church. It, it was not a group of spiritual babies, although there probably were some spiritual babies in this church. It had been existent for, for several years by the time Paul wrote to them in 1 Corinthians. But when he does write to them, he says this in 1 Corinthians 3. Uh, I think it's verses uh, 1 and 2. It says, Brothers and sisters, I could not address you as people who live by the Spirit, but as people who are worldly, mere infants in Christ. I gave you milk, not solid food, for you are not yet ready for it. Indeed, you are still not ready. Now, he's writing this letter to this church that has been in existence for quite some time. And, and even though they have been in existence for quite some time, they were not ready to hear things that were going to cause them to grow. They were still in this infancy state. It was all about the Lord being good and what God does for me and how God can serve me. And they were getting into arguments and, and fights over, uh, over which preachers they liked and things like that. And what was happening is that this group of people were on a spiritual journey. And we've talked about being on a journey here, that you can't, we can't stay here. We're on a journey. We've got to move to that next mountain. And, and like us, the Corinthians were on a spiritual journey. The problem was is on this journey, on this path that they were on, they had hit some rocks and they had gotten hung up. And so what Paul does in the book of, of 1 Corinthians is he goes through this book and he shares with this church, this group, the rocks that they had become snagged on. Okay? And, and so what he's saying, saying, you're supposed to be babies for a season, but you can't be babies for no reason. And here's the reasons that you've become snagged. So, signs of being stuck in immaturity. I want to go through, we're going to go quickly through a survey of 1 Corinthians and talk about these signs. And, and I'm just going to warn you, I'd like to think that we're friends. I, I really would. I, I think of all of you as friends. I want to say that sometimes I say things because I love you, uh, but some of you are going to see yourself in these things. And I want us to stay friends, but if you don't think we can stay friends, this is one of the few times I'm going to tell you it's okay to leave because... Uh, this is tough stuff. What he says to this church is he says, you have gotten hung up on these rocks, and you've got to get unsnagged. And here's what you're hung up on. So anyway, I just want to let you know that uh, we can't move from one mountaintop to the next if we're stuck on the rocks. So the first thing that gets us stuck on the rocks is this. It's strife amongst believers. 1 Corinthians 3, 3, Paul writes these words. For since there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not fleshly? Are you not walking like mere men? Now, what they were doing there was they were fighting over which preachers they liked. Apollos, Cephas, Paul, you know, I, I, I'm of these people. And, and Paul is writing to them saying, listen, it's not about who's speaking. It's about who they're speaking for. Uh, this is about God. It's, it's not about who's doing the talking. It's about is there some Jesus in what they're saying? And he's saying sometimes we get so caught up on personalities and we get so caught up in having our way. We get so caught up in everything else that we have strife. And I'm going to tell you guys, churches never split over biblical issues. Churches always split over personalities. It always happens that way. And churches can get hung up because of personalities rather than moving on and being mature and letting go of some of the strife and the jealousy that goes on in churches. Uh, the second thing is, is there, there's a tolerance, and this is a big one, a tolerance for sexual immorality. Now, I don't talk a lot about this subject, although I plan on hitting it a couple of times this year, uh, just the simple talk of immorality and what immorality is. But you know, you go into the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1, he says this, it's actually reported that there is immorality among you. And basically, between these two things, uh, he says it's something that even the Gentiles don't do, which was, you know, to these Jewish people, it was, it was a bad thing, that someone has his father's wife. He's talking about an incestuous relationship. I know that that's a big word, and, and we, we seem to pick out those immorality things that we think are really bad, but let's, let's tell the truth about it. 
Sexuality is supposed to be within the confines of marriage or the blessing of marriage. I don't consider it confining. The blessing of marriage between a man and a woman. That's how it happens. That's where it's supposed to be. If it's happening anywhere outside of that, then it's immoral. And it, it is physical immorality. And what we do with our bodies is how we honor God. And so if there's some, a place that tolerates that, then that's, that's being hung up on a rock. And it'll keep us from getting from one mountaintop to the next. The next thing I find here is that there's dishonesty in business practices. They were taking one another to court and everything else. And in chapter 6, verse 8, uh, the Apostle Paul writes these words. He says, On the contrary, you yourselves wrong and defraud. You do this even to your brethren. And what he's saying is he's saying you keep taking one another to court, but you're, you're trying to get one over on each other. Uh, and I'll tell you what, some of these pe businesses that have the little fish on their sign that they're a Christian business, I sure hope you are because if you're not, God's going to judge you twice as harshly. Because if people are defrauding one another in business, that is the quickest way in the world to get hung up on a rock. I'm just going to give you a little for instance as far as defrauding one another in business. Uh, my son, uh, last summer, uh, was on a wait staff at a local restaurant. I won't tell you who it is, but their initials are Buffalo Wild Wings. And uh, <laughs> he, he was on the wait staff at, at this restaurant, and he said that there was one day of the week that the waiters hated, and that it was Sunday. And it was because the people would come in, and they were Christians. They would bow their heads and they would pray and they would not tip. Isn't that a shame? And if they did tip, they would tip very little. That's a business practice. That's a transaction. We should be people who are known for our grace, not known for our harshness. Guys, don't, don't be dishonest in your business practices. It's a way to truly hang yourself up in this journey toward righteousness. The next one is using Christian liberty with no regard for the welfare of new Christians. In 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and 9, it says, But take care that this liberty of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. Now, in this particular section, he's talking about eating meat that had been sacrificed to idols. For Christianity, for Christians, that was considered a no-no. For Jews, that was considered a no-no. But there are a lot of things that we do in our everyday life that we don't think about how it affects new Christians or the people who are around us. Uh, for instance... Um, yeah, I'll say this. I, I've been debating whether or not I'll say this, but I'm going to say it because I've got time to say it, but I want to say it. Uh, is it a sin to drink alcohol? Absolutely not. The wine was drank in, in, the old, in the New Testament. It had alcohol. We can call it what we want to call it. Some may have been stronger than others, but it is what it is. But is it a sin to get drunk? Absolutely. During the time of Jesus... Drunkenness was something that was frowned upon vehemently. As a matter of fact, alcoholism was not a common thing during the time of Jesus simply because it was so looked down on by culture. But now people consider it funny. So when we drink publicly, what are we influencing people? How are we influencing people? What are we influencing them to do? Be very careful about your liberty because it, it is not a sin to drink alcohol, but it certainly is a sin to cause a stumbling block for someone else. Now that's just one. And there are a lot of other things. There are things that you can do inside the church that it's perfectly legal, it's perfectly right to do, but are, if, are you by doing it creating a stumbling block for someone else? Be very cognizant of those things because uh, using our Christian liberty with no regard to the welfare of the people around us is a dangerous thing. It'll hang a church up on the rocks. Uh, the next thing is uh, refusing to support the work of God by withholding your contributions. I know preachers always talk about money, right? And so we're going to talk about 1 Corinthians chapter 9. We're going to look at verse 9, and then we're going to skip into verse 11. It says, For it's written in the law of Moses, you shall not muzzle the ox while he is threshing. God's not concerned about oxen, is he? And then we go down to verse 11, it says this, If we sowed spiritual things in you, is it too much if we reap material things from you? Now, he was talking to the church at Corinth. The church at Corinth was not collecting money. They were not able to pay. Uh, uh, they were not paying Paul as he was there. And so I want to make something real clear. I'm not preaching this to say I should be paid more. I am well paid. The, the leaders, the finance committee, everybody that has anything to do with me being paid, I am well compensated for what I do. And I am very grateful for that. And you can also talk to anybody on our church staff. They'll tell you the same thing. They are well compensated for what they do. This church is very generous to us. However, if we're people who are withholding our contribution 
because we don't like something that's going on at the church. Or we're withholding our contribution because of any earthly, selfish reason, we're stuck on a rock. Because we are given things by God to pass along to use for his good glory. And so if we are withholding contribution or refusing to support the work by withholding that contribution, we are stuck spiritually on a rock because we're not really understanding what God is blessing us with things he's blessing us with anyway. Uh, the next thing is to uh, re the refusal to examine oneself, especially during communion. This is in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 28. Uh, it says, but a man must examine himself, and in so doing, he is to eat the bread and drink the cup. You know, how do we know if we're, gonna, if we're progressing, if we're growing as a Christian, if we never really examine who we are? If we never take a look at our lives and decide that, you know, I am progressing. And especially during communion, if we never really know who we are, how can we appreciate the sacrifice of Jesus? I know what kind of guy I am. I shave this ugly mug some mornings. And I can tell you that I know that I'm not good enough to be saved. There's no good actions that I can do. And so I know the reality about who I am. And when I take the communion, when I examine myself, I am so grateful that I have a God who loves me and is willing to sacrifice for me because I am not good enough on my own. The next thing is the failure to walk in love. You know, this is the one thing that uh, is to be the defining mark of the church. Jesus said, by, all things, by this, all men will know you're my disciples if you have love one for another. But Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, 1 and 3, he says this, If I speak with the tongue of men and of angels and have not love, I become as a sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And if I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains but do not have love, look at that next one, I am nothing. And if I give all my possessions to feed the poor and I surrender my body to be burned but do not have love, it profits me nothing. You know, there's only two things in this life that we truly own and we truly possess. We truly possess our failures and we truly possess our reputations. And if our reputation is one of being a loving group of people, we're not stuck on a rock. But if our reputation is that we act in unloving and unkind ways, we're stuck on a rock. You see, there are people in this world that are, are broken and, and they're, they're trapped behind the walls of sin. And you know what the church should be? I don't know if you've ever thought about this or not, but the church itself should be a safe place for those people. It should be a safe place for them to come and, and to try and, and deal with these things. It's a safe place for spiritual babies to come and to grow up. And we should be a safe place because we love one another. And we walk in that love everywhere that we go. And a church that doesn't walk in love is stuck on a rock. And will never get from this mountain to the next. The next one is a lack of concern for those who are unfamiliar with church. Uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 17 through 19, he's talking about speaking in tongues. He says this, uh, For you're giving thanks well enough, but the other person is not edified. I'm going to start again. You are giving thanks well enough, speaking in tongues, but the other person is not edified. They don't know what's going on. I thank God I speak in tongues more than you all. However, in the church... I desire to speak five words with a mind so that I may instruct others rather than a thousand words in a tongue. What he's saying is he's saying, while you do what you do with the people around where you are, we have to stop talking churchy language and be honest and real with one another. Not long ago, my daughter and I were on a trip um, on my sabbatical, as a matter of fact, and we were going to Paducah, Kentucky, but on the way we stopped at a Starbucks. And what you may not know is my daughter used to be a barista at Starbucks, and so she knows the Starbucks language. I don't know if you've ever been in a Starbucks and tried to order a drink, but you have to know the code and the sign language, right? You have to know, all that, you know, the, I want a double frap, double whipped, blah, blah, whatever. Well, she goes in and she rattles it off, and this girl behind the counter, and you know they're writing it on your cup, or at least they're pretending they're writing it on your cup. Well, she, she goes through the whole list that she wants half-calf, light, froth blog you know she's writing all this down and we get the cup back and it looks like hieroglyphics to me i think there was even an obscene gesture drawn on it or something you know 
But there's this language, this insider language that they have that she could speak fluently. And, and I, after she ordered, I didn't know what to say. I just walked up and said, can I have a cup of coffee? I'll put my own cream and sugar in it, really. Just give me coffee. You know, sometimes people come to church feel the same way. We, we, we use these big churchy words, and we go through this big churchy language, and we sing these songs that, that say things that people don't understand, and we have to be very careful uh, because uh, what we do matters to the people who are around us, and we want to make sure that we have a concern for people who are unfamiliar with church, that people that come here can be edified, that they can be lifted up, which edified is another big church word, that they can be lifted up and they can learn something and benefit from, from being here and come in contact with God. The last one is, is a very simple one, but it's a huge one, and that is a lack of belief in the resurrection. In a couple of weeks, we were going to celebrate Easter here, and what you may not know is that at Clear Creek, Easter is the biggest day of the year. It's bigger than Christmas. It's bigger. It's, it's the biggest day of the year because we are celebrating our risen Lord. And if you're not busy right now inviting someone to come to the Easter services at Clear Creek, you don't like them because it's going to be a great day, and, and, and we can't wait to celebrate with one another on that day. So be planning to invite people here because we're going to celebrate the, our belief in the resurrection. And in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul writes these words, 13 and 14, and then verse 19, he says, uh, but if there is no resurrection of the dead, because they didn't believe, there were some in, in this church that didn't believe anybody would ever be raised from the dead, even though they had seen it happen. If there's no resurrection of the dead, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. And then verse 19, he says, If we have hoped in Christ in this life only, we are of all men most to be pitied. I heard someone say not long ago, said if we live this life as a Christian, we find out at the end of this life that all this was a hoax, and you know, haven't we still had a great life? And we have had a great life. But the resurrection is what this is all about, guys. If we don't believe in the resurrection, we don't believe in the power of God, what we've done is we've taken all the supernatural power of our faith and we've thrown it out the window. And that'll stick you on a rock because you start looking at things in worldly ways rather than godly ways and spiritual ways. So these are nine rocks that people can get caught up on. Strife amongst believers, tolerance of sexual immorality, dishonesty in business practice, using our Christian liberty in wrong ways, refusing to support the work of God by withholding contributions, refusing to examine ourselves, a, a, a failure to walk in love, a lack of concern for those who are unfamiliar with church, and a lack of belief in the resurrection. They're rocks that churches get hung up on all the time, and sometimes I see us doing these things. But that's not what you came to hear, is it? What you want to know this morning is, okay, I, I see myself in some of those things. What do I do now? What's next? And, and that's, you know, how do you get unstuck? In Hebrews 6, chapter 1, it says, or chapter 6, verse 1, it says this. Therefore, leaving the elementary teaching about the Christ, let us press on to maturity. And, and I use the New American Standard in that, uh, in that instance because it uses the word press on. Pressing on implies that there's some resistance. And there will always be resistance in growing out of this baby stage of Christianity. You're going to encounter resistance. And so we are going to have to be people who press on through painful situations so that we can move through the cycles of being a Christian into true transformation. And you may not realize this, but there, are, there really are three cycles that everyone goes through in their Christian walk from being an infant to being a mature Christian. And, and I like to compare these things to how we view the holiday Christmas. How many of you remember being a little child at Christmas and you just could not wait for that day? You were going to open gifts, right? And, and it, was a, it was an awesome time. These three steps of maturity, it was an awesome time. And we call this anticipation. It, it's, it's this time where you can't wait to see what's under the tree and you're excited about the whole magic of the season and, 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 and you're thrilled to death and, and Christmas always seems so far away. You remember that? This like, man, this seems like it's forever. And we get close and it's like, Mom, how many more days of Christmas? There are 20 days of Christmas. Can't we open some gifts now? And, and some of you guys cheat because you open gifts on Christmas Eve. We all know that's a sin. But you just can't wait, right? And you remember that excitement and everything else. And then you go through later on, and, and usually it's about the age of 12 to 20 that you go through this. It's called transition. 
uh, it, it's like, yeah, Christmas is coming. That's kind of cool. But, you know, I know some truth about this Christmas thing that I didn't know before. And all this magic is kind of wearing off. And, you know, I know what's under the tree, by the way. I asked for an iPhone, and, yeah, that box is the same shape as an iPhone. So guess what I'm getting? I'm getting an iPhone. It's not that big a deal. However, uh, you go by what we go by at our house, and that is if you don't believe, you don't receive. So you kind of play along, and you go through it because there's still something in it for you. And, and a lot of times in this transition period for Christians, you're going through the same thing. Uh, all, the, all the magic, all the excitement is kind of worn off. Uh, and, and, but, you know, you're still getting something out of it. You're still going to get to see your friends. You're still going to uh, sing the songs that you like. You're still going to get to do some of the things that you really look forward to doing. But, you know, the magic's just not quite there. And, and uh, we see people go through that transition stage. And you start picking out everything that's wrong rather than everything that's right. And uh, the problem is, is that it's still about you. You know, in the anticipation stage, it's about me, but I'm excited about it. I can't wait to go to church because I don't know what's going to be revealed to me next. I can't wait to be with my Christian friends because something cool is going to happen. And I get to be, and that's excitement. And then later on, you get to that transition. And it just, it's still about you, but it just doesn't seem as good until you go through that transformation phase. For me, the transformation phase happened uh, uh, when my first child came along. Actually, before my first child came along, she was due in January, and uh, that Christmas, I actually bought her a Christmas gift and was in an automobile accident doing it. And I'll never forget that as long as, I, as long as I live. But once you see that child, and you see them opening those gifts, it takes on a whole new meaning. It takes on a whole new depth. And that's what happens with transformed Christians. It's no longer about what can I do and what can I get out of this, although we still get things out of this. It becomes about something deeper, about something more. It becomes about how can I help others? What can I do to help other people? What can I do to glorify God? It's about Him. And so we get to this transformation phase, and we grow, and we become mature. Now, we've talked about being stuck on these rocks. And we've talked about what it means to be mature. It's about someone else. The question is this. You're probably sitting out there thinking, okay, I see myself in some of the things you've talked about being stuck. Or I'm in that transition phase. So how do I get out of that? How do we, how do we move away from that? Is there a shortcut? Are you like me? You always want to know what the shortcut is? You know, I want to be mature tomorrow. And I want to tell you that, yeah, there's a shortcut. There really is. I mean, it, it's not a, a big thing. There's three things I'll talk to you about in a minute. A lot of people will go about this the wrong way. A lot of people will say, okay, I want to become spiritually mature, so I want to go to a workshop. And they'll start taking in all these workshops. Or maybe I want to be a part of a Bible study group, and they'll take in all these Bible study groups. And studying the Bible is important. I mean, it really is. The problem is, is usually when we're in transition or we're stuck on a rock, it's not because we don't know enough. Uh, honestly, most Christians are educated far beyond their level of obedience anyway. So you want to know the three things that you can do that will get you jump-started toward maturity? Number one. Pray for someone who has caused great conflict in your life. Think of that one person that just rubs you the wrong way or is constantly looking at a way to one-up you or pick on you or whatever. Find that person, and I want you to pray for them every day for a month. A month? Yeah, a month, because that's how you start new habits. Second thing you can do is do something for someone else at personal cost with no expectation of being paid back. Actually do something. Don't read about doing something. Don't show a story about someone else who did something. Go do something for someone else that is going to cost you personally and don't expect anything in return. That will press you toward maturity. And the last one's this. If there's a room in your life somewhere, this, this little, because, you know, we live in these rooms in our life. If there's a room in your life that you've got locked 
And it's your little secret. You don't want God in there because once he gets in there, he's going to ask you to change what's in there. And you don't want to change what's in there. You're holding on to it. You've got to unlock that room. You can do it a lot of different ways. If you need people to pray with you, this church will pray with you. If you need our elders to serve you, they'll be in rooms A5 and 7 across the hall when we have an invitation. But whatever happens, we have got to pray for those who persecute us. We have got to serve people without asking for anything in return. And we've got to give up the things in our life that are hanging us up on the rocks.